Hi, I'm here. This is uh, six call of the day, Kevin. Well, so, that's a lot. My favorite kind of days, but I'm here. We're going to do it. And I guess feedback, um, our producer, Olivia, I think it was maybe just her feedback, but she likes spicy Kevin. So I think we all love spicy Kevin. Spicy and like trolling Kevin. Oh, <laughs> I live for it. Yeah, I remember the 10,000 hour thing you schooled us on, Julie. I think <laughs> that's, so I just got exposed at this conference that's about nothing um, other than learning. And the people are all totally different is, again, that realization of like, I'm old because I care about things that my 20 year old self would have been like, why does that have, why does it matter? Why, mm -hmm. why are we thinking about, you know, <laughs> what is space made of? Like it's empty space, you moron, move on. But I'm here, I'm listening to this guy talk about the units that make up space and how that defines time and thinking, how does this apply to what we do? And I can make connections and it's it's weird, just, I, I, where, am I, where, where was I going? It's, <laughs> it's this 10,000 hour thing of, how, how do I translate that to someone who only has a hundred hours in, mm -hmm. in a way that's meaningful? Because even like I was trying to download our team about one of my takeaways. And then I'm like, this won't mean anything to some people. Like they'll, they will actually think, why did Kevin waste his time going to California to listen and learn about this? And so anytime you're, sharing you have to understand your audience and and where they are but it's it gets harder in some ways it gets easier this is why now i remember why i wanted to talk to you about this julie is it's it's somewhat easier to process through the stuff like on the back burner of your brain but it's mm -hmm. even harder like i'm finding myself pausing more often like i have a small seizure and it's because i'm it's not because i don't understand the material it's thinking like, how do I reframe this or filter it for this person who's been in our industry for a month? Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah, that gets think, incrementally harder, I think, at least for me. I mean, it's hard. I just had a call this week where I was like, I, how, what did I just say? Cause it was a, <laughs> one of those challenging situations of like, how, is, and that's exactly what's happening to me. It was like, there was the stop in my brain of like trying to filter out what was going on in my head and what was coming out of my mouth in a way that would be digestible to the person on the other line. And it probably was to them, but to me, I was like, nope, that I and need to get back on a rhythm. <laughs> but that's where the storytelling comes in. And I think y'all are both great at that. Even when you don't realize that you're pulling in a story or an example or something. So I see that, you know, Kevin, if we're sitting in on a call and you're pulling from something, some example <laughs> you've heard or a story. So I think that's what you're trying to attach the two things. You're trying to attach the concept to whatever Rolodex of stories and examples are in there somewhere to connect them. Yeah. Here's, here's the tang most recent example of this that I still am processing a little bit is working with a rather, I mean, a very large home building organization who wants to create a new set of dashboards on a quarterly basis to give to their leadership team about marketing and online sales and how it's going. And they showed uh, an example of an old one that they've been doing um, internally. I think some other people were helping them and it was like 45 pages. And we rebuilt one after much thinking and work and it's nine pages i think or sorry it's 11 pages it's 11 pages but the first four pages are just an illustration of the proverbial funnel illustrating at the state level individual market level etc how everything is working like all of the important metrics the conversion ratios and visually how they all connect and then as i'm thinking about the audience that they're going to give this to and, mm -hmm. and this is a presentation format too. I think it's important to understand. So they're like, the person who used to do this, they hated their life for that entire day because when it was their turn to stand up and talk, they went through all 45, 50 pages and watched everyone's eyes glaze over or start looking at their phone or, you know, they, and 
we interpret that sometimes as how those people are so rude. How could they not? But to me, it was more like, actually, you should probably never get past these first five pages that are funnel analysis with this audience. Mm -hmm. If you get to page whatever, and it's a 14 way breakdown of how their Google ads are performing, something's wrong because it's not, it's not the level that a CEO, COO should be at ever. Yeah. Yeah. I love and they need something to anchor onto. And with that visualization, visual, <laughs> visual, <laughs> visual. <laughs> this makes me feel so good about Why myself. I'm I sorry. Not You're not supposed to. The word with the funnel. Uh, there's many words I can't say. <laughs> with Wait, the funnel, well it's something they can anchor to. Um, because if you just start going through numbers, if they're trying to connect, they're just going to grab a random stat number and get stuck on that. And you're going to get into a weird hole of questions that you may not want to be into. So that gives yeah. them a good first thing to hang on to as you're taking them through the journey. Well, and I, okay, I'm going to try to keep my brain and then we're, we'll be, we'll be, we'll move on to the real show here in a second. But one thing that went through my brain is this is a bad idea. Like as a, as a builder partner, they're going to hate this idea that I'm presenting of making the funnel, the main part, and then being able to break out why afterwards or during Q and a, but just really focusing on, on funnel analysis. Mm -hmm. And I kind of saw a little bit like, uh, but if they're not comfortable hanging out at that level for 20 minutes with the leadership team, there's some people who are like, hurry up and get to the part where like I'm in every day and I understand and I know that I know more than they do about it. And so I feel comfortable presenting and talking and looking through versus staying high level with high level individuals sometimes can be intimidating. And so there was a little bit of storytelling and example giving that had to give them the confidence of you don't even have to know all the answers. You have to know, understand the relationships, but that's part of like this will work if they start getting excited and talking to each other about how come appointments are converting to sales in the same way as they were last quarter or why do we think so so is this it's this weird thing of am i just shortcutting the shortcut or is this really the most important anyway that's i think it's a matter of is the presentation as important as the dialogue that occurs around it you know, like if the presentation doesn't invoke an interesting dialogue that can lead to change, then what is the point of the presentation in the first place? It's just another hour great point. of someone else's time. And this is why I love the fact that I'm married to my husband and I know that he is listening right now. Um, so <laughs> shout out Mike. Um, but he does like, he briefs for a living. He briefs very important people for a living and he is phenomenal at his ability to take a very complex subject matter and articulate it in a way that not only gets people engaged and, and um, provokes conversation, at least this is what I get. I don't really know what he does. So this is just my perception of it. Because if he and told like, you, he'd, he'd have to kill you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is my perception of it. But it's fascinating watch him, watching him talk about the art around briefing and it's just like us like it's the art around coaching it's the art around speaking to high level individuals it's there's an art about it and you have to tailor what it is that you do to your audience in order to provoke conversation that will lead to change and it it's fascinating how many people actually do that wrong yeah i mean and senior leadership's perspective usually is why is this person telling me numbers that i can look at and see numbers. Yeah. So you, you don't need to be mm -hmm. presenting like a you know first grader at show and tell. Yeah. And it's like, how many times do we hate going to conferences where people are just reading slides? slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you got, you got to make a conversation out of it. And, and just like in home and home buying and home and selling and in marketing for, for builders, we have to create emotion during the process because emotion is oftentimes a trigger to, to everything else that follows. And so like the ability to do that with high level, you gotta, you gotta like pull somewhere to start that conversation. Yeah. And not be afraid of a little bit of, um, 
Conflict. Conflict, right? In fact, a lot of times as a marketer, you're, that's why I keep going back to the example of Survivor. It's like players who win Survivor sometimes are creating conflict artificially when there wasn't one or they're amplifying mm -hmm. con conflict in another party. Uh, sometimes they're, I mean, it's, it's, it is such a good, like, like chess and poker, good analogy. Okay. A little, um, palate cleanser before we start the show, Sean Carpenter texted me this. Sorry, Sean, you didn't give me permission to share it, but he texted me. So you should know better. He said, it blew my mind today, listening to the podcast that Jen wanted to be a vet when she was younger. I feel like this should be, uh, like Jerry, read in Jerry Seinfeld voice. And so she ended up marrying her husband. And now she still gets to hear barking all day at work. <laughs> Dog emoji, laughy face emoji. All right, let's get started. Another thing that we like more as we get older, puns. <laughs> all right, let me, I'm gonna stand up. I'll change my energy level too. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to episode 303. I'm Kevin Oakley and with me today is Beth Russell and Julie Jarnigan. Hello. Hi. We don't have to, yeah, we keep talking about this. There's nothing else to say. We already said it. So we just go right into story time. All right, Julie. Okay. I have a, a fun conversation with a builder this week. So she said, we have this great vendor, high quality, makes videos for us, but they're really expensive. And she said, we do, you know, that's kind of our company branding videos. We do some community videos. But she was like, I want to do all these house tours and this and that, but they're so expensive and I don't have room in the budget. So we had a really fun conversation around video and not just your very produced high quality video. The number one thing I would say, but this doesn't work for them, is you need to learn internally how to do some of this video yourself and start doing it. But in this specific case, they are maxed out. Like their team just got smaller. They all shift roles. They're all, she, they're just doggy paddling, you know, trying to keep up with everything. So then we took it down to the level of finding multiple vendors um, for different things. So just like you might have a professional pay the big money for the um, main photo on your homepage, you can do the same thing with video. You can take somebody who's fresh out of college or how, whatever to do your video. Um, but what it all came back to is even that takes legwork. Like you're going to have to know, you can't just say, I want to do more video. So we're going to do video if you are maxed out and everything else. So this whole conversation of video and finding somebody else, and that may take a few people and you're going to have to be really specific at first about what you want it for and what it needs to look like and who's going to edit it and how they're going to know where to go. And you're going to have to see if that's in your priorities of things. So it was funny too, because the owner happened to be on this meeting and he was just sitting oh. there quietly <laughs> through the whole conversation. So it was just interesting because in the end, it's still all, I love video. I wrote a whole book on content. I think everybody needs more and better content, but in the end, you only have so many hours, so many mm -hmm. man hours and so um, much budget. And it's whether this is the time for that or if that needs to be on your 2024 plan and how you're going to set all that up so it was a fun conversation to work through with them yeah again it's different perspectives different levels mm -hmm. different insights different priorities but i think um i'll intersperse some things that i took away but but one of the people who spoke at the conference i went to was the ceo of shopify and he talked about how they created a tool that shows the cost of every meeting. So when you invite people, every time you invite more people to your meeting, it shows the incremental cost of the organization. And when you see, you know, $9,000 for a 30 minute meeting, you know, you have to justify in a summary, if you called the meeting, why it's worth that much after it happens. Anyway, a little, a little extreme, you could argue, but then he also started talking about how they, every year they just delete all reoccurring meetings. He's going to start just randomly deleting Slack channels. And the idea here is, if it needs to happen, it'll start again. But if not, you're just keeping things. And, and so just that idea of revisiting on a regular basis, why am I doing this thing? Could be video, mm -hmm. could be Google ads, it could be anything. Why am I doing it? 
This is the reason that I started, still the reason why I should continue. Do I need to take a different spin? Should I be doing this at all? That whole, you know, stop doing list is as important as the to-do list. Well, and on that level, it's really interesting because she um, has been there a while, but somebody else has been kind of in the marketing director role and that person shifting out. So she's just adopting. And she that person was great at her job, amazing, but it's somebody walking into something that's already existing. And so I oh. think that's going to be a big job for her is then figuring out what oh, how that's what more needs, fun let's just talk about changes that need to um, be made if mm -hmm. should, should, should she go and start making changes quickly what what would you both tell someone who's dropped in that position of like taking over for someone who's done a great job but is is no longer in that role i think i mean having just left somewhere and someone that i i knew and worked with kind of walk into my position slightly I think it's really interesting where it's kind of like a, a marriage of both where, you know, you want to go fast in terms of making your own name and learn and, and get your hands dirty, but you don't want to make too many changes that are going to rock the boat because you might not know enough yet and go in the complete opposite direction. So I think it takes that time. Like Julie said, like, taking that time to walk through the options and the realities of, of what is actually available when it came to video and what was realistic. Okay. I see a problem here. I see something that I could change, but at the end of the day, capacity wise, investment wise, like this doesn't need to change right now. I can do this later. It's not like a necessity for me to go in and just like rip everything to shreds. Essentially, this is me being dramatic, but you know, yeah. Julie, you have any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree that there's definitely a time period for um, keeping it as is and seeing how things work and really um, not making too many dramatic changes right when you walk in, unless she's she's been in a, a role in the department. So there are probably things she's familiar with enough, but brand new things she's taking over. Yeah, I think it's worth some observation time um, before making any huge changes, which I don't think she is. Yeah. <laughs> She's I, listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I always would tell someone is don't change anything for, um, un until you are certain, you know, what the issues are. And what I mean by that is the, one of the reasons you don't change anything is because it doesn't require any of your cognitive load. If you're maintaining, it's a lot easier to maintain than it is to create or destroy. Um, maybe it's easier to destroy than anything, but that's, I don't want to get off topic, but you, you're just letting things flow and, and observing because one of the things you have to understand quickly is that the scoreboard is not the only scoreboard. So there might be some internal scoreboard or dashboard or whatever that says leads are up good. Sales are up good but it all depends on the person you're working for. And it's a combination of that scoreboard and that person's perspective of everything. I've worked for people as a marketing director who have said, you know, like, we don't need more leads. I don't want you doing anything to create more leads. Leads aren't our problem. Go solve this other thing. And I'm like, um, I'm new here, but when they hired me, my, they told me my job was to create leads. So, that's the risk is you don't have street credibility for that position. Even if you've been in that organization, everyone's looking to try to figure out, did, did they earn this title? Did they just get this title because the other person left? What's going on? And so you still need to do an analysis of both scoreboards and look for the easy win opportunities that cause the least disruption for others, because that's how you prove value is, I just made everyone's life better and you had to do nothing different. Do that for as long as you can before you have to start getting in the middle of everything else. Now, sometimes you don't get lucky and like the thing that has to be blown up is the fact that <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing as I say this, it's only been true a couple times. You're like, we just have to fire all the salespeople and start over. And I can show you mathematically and in the CRM why that's true. That would be a really hard place to start. Mm -hmm. But then that, sometimes that is the case. But if not, 
for as long as possible, get the easy wins that have big impact on other people's roles. All right, Beth, what do you got? Well, this week was my birthday week. Um, oh, happy birthday. Thanks. I'm getting all the sound effects today. This is great. <laughs> you should have worn your tiara today. I should have worn my tiara and my sash. That would, except it ripped out my hair, which was not a pleasant <laughs> experience. It's super pretty, though, so I really should have worn it. That would have been great. Um, but yeah, I'm not typically one to reflect on my previous year. I'm just like, oh, you know, it's another year. I'm another year older. It's fine. Um, but this year I was kind of, it was somewhat unavoidable because it was on my birthday last year that it became abundantly clear that all of the goals that I was working towards and the goals that I had set for myself in my pro professional career were not going to happen. I was, I was not going to achieve them at my current place of work. And this realization was dramatically catastrophic to me. <laughs> um, and it forced me to take off blinders that I didn't even know existed. Um, and it forced me into a period of serious reflection in my life. Um, that a period that, that lasted from probably anywhere between four and six months, um, where obviously a lot of changes happened because now I am here. Um, but it's interesting because I was in the mindset at that time before all of this happened that no matter what, I was going to stay on this path. I had my goal. I was going to achieve it. And I had already given so much of myself in order to achieve what I had achieved that the idea of leaving that was so incredibly uncomfortable to me that I had basically avoided any thought of change. <laughs> Yeah, fully like those blinders were, were up. Um, but now I was in it, like, I was forced into a stage where I had to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. And for me, there was nothing more uncomfortable than the thought of leaving someplace I loved, and that I had dedicated my time to and um, that had brought me so much joy. And I share this not just because, like, for whatever reason, just to share it, I think it's because no, I know it's because that at one point in all of our lives, we we come to that place or to that crossroads where we have to get comfortable in the uncomfortable, whether it's in our personal life or our professional life. We are at one point in our life going to come across something where we are forced to make a decision that we, we never thought that we would make. And it is so incredibly uncomfortable for us. But the reality of it is that it's only through doing that are you able to make a change for the better. And what I learned during that period of my life was that change is okay. And that it's important to not go through that alone. I had, I had to make that decision, a very personal and selfish decision. I had to make that and come to that on my own, but mm -hmm. I leaned on the people around me that supported me and not just the people that were going to nod my head and like nod their head and agree with me or go into a, a period of self pity with me or like crawl into that ditch with me, but people that were going to force me to want better for myself and force me into change and, and, and force me to ask myself questions that I had, I had been previously avoiding because they were so invested in my success and they wanted something better for me. So in saying that, I mean, you don't have to do it alone. Lean on the people around you, find people that will challenge you and support you, find good mentors and just make that next change. Because I think this last year has been incredibly fulfilling for me incredibly, incredibly challenging. And I, if you would have asked me this on my birthday last year of where, you, where I would be in my professional career, I don't think I would, an I would answer that I'm a marketing coach. at do convert. Right. <laughs> and it's been fun and exciting. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I'm here. Well, we are happy that you are here, but I skating part things that make me feel on strange or uncomfortable like yeah. se self celebrating ourselves always makes me uncomfortable um same thing i mean I, I remember the first time uh not the first time it was it was the third year that mike lyon was like hey kevin i think there's this thing and i think you could 
come work with me. And I was like, at the time I was 32 years old. I was running uh, two home building divisions for NVR. I had stock options that were worth millions of dollars. And Mike's pitch was take a 70% pay cut and come work with me and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and I was like, Reassuring. I have four, I, I have four kids. My, my wife just gave birth to our fourth. What none of this makes sense. But again, this, I, I'm going to keep doing this for a while probably, but this conference that I just went to one of the speakers um, is the CEO and founder of, I think the second uh, most profitable options trading firm of all time. Uh, and I, she showed this slide, like if you gave her a hundred dollars, uh, back in, in the eighties, you would have $3 million now. Like that's how much money her company has made for herself and her employees. And so now she started this nonprofit specifically trying to teach women how to play poker because her argument is that women need to learn the skill sets of poker. And to her, one of the most important skill sets is knowing that it's okay to take risk, that risk is mandatory. You, you have your dealt a hand of cards. You've got to make a calculation and a decision of what should I do or not do. But also sometimes you, if you just fold every hand, you're never going to win. And her take uh, as a woman was just that women are never taught to take risk. And even in my own life, like I'm, I'm definitely the, yeah, I'll just to stay out with poker, like just play super conservative, get that pot as big as you can. And just like, hope you win by causing everyone else to die of boredom and just like irrationally go all in because they're just sick of sitting there. Like that's, that's a strategy. But, um, so I, when I hear you talk about that story, I just, what I, what I translate it to is part of it is chasing the goal that you had. Mm -hmm. And the other part is just saying, uh, uh, like that's too risky. But now on the other side, do you feel like it was as risky as it felt? No, not at all. And I think like I, I battle with the word risk slightly because I don't know if I necessarily felt like it was risky. I think perhaps a little bit, it was like, okay, I just built all this. Like, am I willing to risk like completely altering everything I just worked for for seven years, right? So I guess, yeah, there is, a, there is a little bit of risk in there involved, but ultimately it came down to compromise. It came down to how much of myself am I willing to compromise and what am I even living out? One of my mentors is Will Juder Sat. He's also a very good friend of mine. And he was the one that was like, sat me down and he was like, what is your superpower? And are you living it out right now? And we had like a two hour conversation actually at summit after hours about like what that meant. And like, he just started ripping out those blinders that I had. And I think it was just that I had compromised a little bit of what my superpower was in order to fit the box of what other people needed. And yeah, and it was, it felt really We're on the psychiatrist, psychiatrist couch together. So this is, a, but is great. I know you don't like the word risk, but what, yeah. what I think is probably happening is the fear of not getting to where you wanted to mm -hmm. was causing you to put the blinders on in the first place. Oh yeah. Like if, if, if I don't put the blinder on, I'm not going to attain the level or position that I want to get to. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, the biggest risk um, that the speaker and when I go back and talk to other people or look at my own life, it's like the biggest risk would have been not doing anything yep. but that's i always say that's the donut you're trying to sell someone the donut hole the cutout like not an actual small little piece of a donut but you're selling the thing that doesn't exist and saying that's the problem so that's that's the hard part about it but taking risk is okay and i like any of my friends personal friends um who've been like hey i'm thinking about starting my own business or doing my own thing my mm -hmm. answer is always do it always Mm -hmm. because the risk is not like you're not going to die if your business dies, but you will know whether you actually want to run a business or not. And yeah. if you're capable or not, mm -hmm. so just go do it. If, if death is not on the other side, it's worth trying. Now, 
that also like as an efficiency focused organization, which I would consider do you convert like one of the ways I explain to people is we are an efficiency focused digital marketing uh, organization trying to help builders get the best quality traffic for the least amount of money. Mm -hmm. So one of the things in there is like a lot of what we do is working and we might not be taking the risk with someone's money individually. So like builder A of 80 or builder number one of 80. Mm -hmm. We might, based upon their resources and availability, might not be doing a lot of testing with them, but across all 80 builders, there's always different tests being done. And that's a that's analysis of risk. And I, I feel like I should just write a whole blog on maybe a series on risk because I, I it's not talked about enough. And as a manager, we know we have to manage people. We know we have to manage a budget. Managing risk is not talked about enough or understood clearly enough. And it's really, really important. It blindsides people more than missing a budget. Yeah, I would agree. I feel like we could really take this even further. This is fascinating. Okay. Um, first story time, just to get out of the way, it, uh, Olivia reminded me that there. I want to talk about like things that we just keep repeating in our industry. And it's not really the thing. It's the, it's the, well, it is partly the thing. So one example would be, and these are all things, by the way, I have said too. So it's not casting stones with glass houses, but I remember the very first presentation I gave at the Builder Show and at PCBC. Um, I talked about a backpack on Amazon having more content than a home builder's quick moving home. That was uh, 14, 15 years ago. So let's just get more creative. And this again, this is for, for me as, as well as everyone else. Let's get more creative with our examples. If we've heard an example 30 times in the last 10 years as a as a presenter or someone making content i think we should all push ourselves to keep looking for more and different examples and i'll give you one of mine that i've pushed my, you know so i've talked about pre-sale without fail and wrote the book and given all kinds of presentations and done it and yet the audience and this is we keep repeating the same thing because we're like the audience hasn't heard it enough and we know repetition is important so we say it again and again and again but I think my challenge is let's get more creative to try to find out if it's not just us, the presenter, that's repeating the same thing people have heard, but not actually finding a way to help them solve the problem. And that's why I use stories and analogies is because my hope is that the person I'm telling that to can retell the story and get a similar outcome or help people's opinions or mindset change. So a lot of times builders on their on their home site maps or community descriptions are talking about, you know, phases one through 17 and all of them are on the map and they're on phase one, but they're showing everything. And so for me, the example is, you know, Apple just came out with the iPhone 15 and the 15 pro and someone tweeted immediately after the, like, I'm on my way to apple.com to order my iPhone 14. Can't wait for it. It's like no one does that. As soon as the 15 is announced, the only people buying the 14 are price conscious folks who probably can't afford or wouldn't buy a 15 anyway. But it would be as insane for Apple to put on their website iPhone. I mean, I can do it now. I can I can project into the future mm -hmm. the iPhone 17 coming September of 2025. You would never, ever, ever see that on Apple's website because you can't buy it yet. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the process of launching neighborhood, there's, there's a period where you're going to put that community out there and you can't buy it because you're building that list. But Apple knows how long they need to build their list. And it's about two to three weeks from the time we say it's here to the time that you can go online and order it. They have figured out through probably millions of dollars and out, you know, tons of research that that's the only window they need to have. So you got to figure out what your window is, and, but, but you don't need to communicate years or decades in advance that you're going to have home site 2,312 available at some point. Like, so just let's, let's get creative because if, if the industry isn't solving that problem, we can go back to content around a backpack if we have to. But the more interesting question that I think our whole industry needs to start thinking about is, what are the barriers? Because the barrier is not 
anyone I talk to, I don't know if you two are talking to people, but I haven't heard anyone say, no, we've got enough content on all of our stuff. Like I'm good with it. Our pictures are all awesome. Our descriptions are great. No one's happy with the content they have. So what's the real problem? And we keep pointing the finger. This is going to get me excited. We keep pointing the finger at marketers. And if you're interacting with marketers on a regular basis, you know, the problem is not that the marketer doesn't want the content. Maybe, and this is why I'm so big on Hierarch as a potential solution for this in our industry. You can go Mm -hmm. visit visit them and and Mark and Beth are doing a presentation at the summit. Hierarch understands that the reason we have crappy content is because people who aren't marketers are constantly changing the product with irregard and no care as to whether we have content, just made content. There's just like this little hidden space in every home building company where four people who have no connection to consumers or marketers are coming mm-hmm. up with all these new things and changing stuff all the time. And like, yeah, just figure it out. Just figure yeah. it out. Like that's the freaking problem yeah. that needs to get addressed. Not how to hire a photographer. Did you know that you can get renderings done? Like for that's such baloney. That's not the problem. The problem is that there's these other morons changing things too often that no one's asking to be changed. Like if they're, how often, how often do people redesign cars, right? Once it's a year, it's yeah. usually on like a three year, mm-hmm. three to five year thing. And there's little micro changes in between. Mm-hmm. They don't, and they don't have 45 different cars available yeah. at Toyota to go buy. Preach Kevin. And then we're going to show <laughs> Toyota's car, car selection tool. And they're like, this is amazing. Look what it can do. Cause there's only seven different car types. Yeah. There's like five colors like that, to choose from. That's why when NVR bought <laughs> Heartland and they, we had 45 different floor plans and they said, Nope, you can have 12. And after the initial freak out of that's not possible, we'll never sell another house again. Everyone's going to want something we don't have. Mm-hmm. I got so freaking excited as a marketer because thinking of, of, okay, I'm going to defend my budget. I'm going to keep that same amount of money, but now I can develop content around 12 floor plans instead of mm-hmm. 45. Yeah. Oh, it was like angels started singing. It was, this is going to be the most incredible thing ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just look for, this- look for what's causing things not to change, not just telling the people that it needs to change, please. I literally just had this conversation with a builder yesterday and you were not on the call because I asked them what is, because they're overloaded, what is eating up your time right now? And that's mm-hmm. what, that's what it was. That's what it was. Those four people in a room somewhere making changes without talking to anyone. (laughs) Yes. And all they're doing is updating floor plans and rendering all this. So it's just funny that you say that because I literally just had this conversation with someone yesterday. Yeah. Well, (laughs) I mean, at ideal, they have collaborative teams that Mm -hmm. work on such things at Stylecraft, Mm -hmm. where you were Beth, they have collaborative teams, cross department teams that work on this things. Yep. But so many builders I interact with, I'm like, who does this stuff? But it was still a problem. Like Steve in accounting, whatever the guy's <laughs> name is from that commercial. I'm like, oh, totally okay, Steve, Steve no. thanks. Thanks, thanks, Steve. No, I mean, it's it was still a problem, though. I mean, we had um, a huge group of us coming across, like you said, from all different departments coming together to make these decisions. But the changes were still happening so often that I had to just eventually put my foot down and saying. I'm not changing it until this is an issue or I have this many changes or whatever. Or if we're making this many changes, I need this to be the process that we follow because there's just no way that as a singular person or in in our case, two people that we're going to be able to maintain content across 40 communities with 40 different floor plans (laughs) with 40 different variations of things happening. Like that's just that is outside of the, of the realm of reality. And there, there are answers coming and here now to do it better and differently. One from other industries, two from products like Hierarch. And this is, mm-hmm. I mean, again, if you're listening and you're coming to the summit, you're going to hear it. It's not like you're going to not hear this talk, but yeah, there are ways to get what we want and need. And there's ways to go about the changes better, which again, I don't want to say too much about because we'll talk about at the summit. And I have a blog post that I finally wrote a blog post and Julie edited it. Shout out Julie. (laughs) Um, That is about different ways that we can go about making changes or planning, planning things out. Because I don't think that as an industry, we're doing it 
the most efficient way. No. No, not at all. All right. First up from the news, will the mortgage rate spread narrow or not? That is the question from firstam.com. And this, uh, remember I went on a tirade about like, if you're a marketer trying to ignore what interest rates are, how mm -hmm. they are determined, all that stuff, it's time to go to school. By the way, that was my actual story. I got distracted. I didn't share my story time. But one of the notes that I wrote down was um, Bill Gurley, uh, prominent investor, uh, venture capitalist said um, that the idea of professional research no longer exists for most people. Meaning when your teacher in school assigns you to do a research project on uh, you know, the pyramids of Giza, you either lie and makes things up or today use chat GPT, or you go and read books, watch documentaries, like you consume this information. Mm -hmm. And yet the concept of professional research done outside of work hours is like, are they paying me for do this? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you just wanna find the answer or learn because it's going to make you better, which will eventually pay you more because you are better. But it, it kind of goes along with, this is a continuation of that rant from previous episode anyway. So this is an example of me. So I, I see this article posted and my first reaction is I've spent 200 hours learning about mortgage rates and how to determine all the rest. I don't need to read any more on this topic, but what the heck I'm stuck for two hours on a plane that's not taking off. So I'm going to read the article and um, essentially what, what the author argues is that one of the things that we're not thinking about that will keep rates higher for longer mm -hmm. is the fact that rates being higher where most people think they're going to, like everyone's dating the rate, right? Every, everyone's waiting to refi. And one of the things that causes rates to be held higher is the belief that people are going to pay off their loans early. So if I'm uh, buying a mortgage backed security, that's supposed to be full of loans that are 7% for 30 years. What's the likelihood that those loans go for the entire 30 year period and aren't paid off early. If rates mm -hmm. go back down to five, right? All those are gone. Mm -hmm. And so that risk of loans being, that's a negative thing for an investor to have loans paid off early. Mm -hmm. And because that negativity, there's extra costs being that, that then raise the rate because of that thing. Like I had no idea that that was part of the calculation, but it makes sense. Now the inverse yeah. is also true. I was on a coaching call this morning and the builder said, yeah, you know what? We've noticed that buy downs are becoming less expensive for builders or this builder in particular. Why would that be? Because the inverse is also true. This is why I love learning stuff. It gets me so freaking excited. The inverse is true. Why would a buy down be less expensive? Because what's the likelihood that, yes, I am going to charge the builder money to buy down the rate. But if now that customer is going to get a 4.875% loan, what's the likelihood that they will carry that loan through to maturity? It's higher mm -hmm. because if rates go down to six or five, they're not redoing that loan. Mm -hmm. So they were saying, you know, it's still, hey, it's three and a half, four percent, but it's it used to be seven to buy that down. So it just never pays to, to continue doing professional research because it's just always insightful to me when I learn something new. It makes me excited. Yeah, and this article is worth reading because I do not get quite as excited uh, as Kevin <laughs> on all of this. But this one, when I read it, it was, it did lay things out in a way that it was like little light bulbs went off and helped explain it. So if you're also struggling to make sense of all of this, this is a good one to go and click on yeah, and, and read. Again, because people will she clip something well. or say Kevin's, you know, just a mad old man. No, I'm not saying you have to understand it. I'm saying stop <laughs> trying to not understand it. That's all I'm saying. Like, keep yeah. trying to understand it. Don't just say, uh. Find new ways to explain what's happening in the industry other yeah. than the backpack. Yeah. All right. From redfin.com, one in 10 home sellers, who found this one, by the way, they deserve a prize because this one, I love this one. One in 10 home sellers are moving because they're being called back to the office. Do we know who found this article? 
I'm I'm looking, but I don't I'm, see I'm it. I'm gonna default to our fantastic. I think it's producer. Olivia. Okay, good job, Olivia. Um, return to office mandates are forcing some people to choose between selling their home at a loss or losing their job, and asterisks turning it into a rental potentially. Roughly 20% of surveyed sellers say they're moving due to safety crime concerns, a desire to live somewhere more aligned with their social views and or lower taxes. But 10% said they are moving because they have to go back to the office. Hmm. I mean, it goes back to, I think it's an interesting like granular data point of like, because they specifically, because they have to go back to the office because we think about like relocation and things like that. And it's just, oh, my work is moving me. But in this case, like, no, your work is forcing you to actually come in and now you need to li live closer. It, it kind of, did you see the um, post from the New York Post article about the project by EYA in Montgomery oh, County, yeah. Maryland? Oh, it, yeah. it almost makes me think about that a little bit because like they are doing a project that allows for lower income people to, instead of doing the, the, um, 10% or whatever, they increased it to 40% of lower income in this building. And they are trying to increase the amount of available housing in a safe area that allows for a, a closer commute. And the example in the article of someone who lives in that building is an individual who's like, I think she was like a nurse or a paraeducator or something like that. I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, but she because this became available to her, her commute cut down from a 45 minute commute to a 10 minute commute. Now for a little bit of perspective, even 45 minutes in the Montgomery County area. So anywhere around the greater DC, Baltimore metropolitan area, 45 minutes is a win. So for her to be able to have 10 minutes of a win, um, is, is gigantic. And so there are these people that are are now trying to get to work and having to go to work every day. And they're just trying to get closer. They need to get closer. And it goes back to their need to move because their life is requiring them to. Yeah. Remember that's the fifth of the five D's displacement that causes mm -hmm. people to need to find a new home. And we're seeing this, you know, we, we work with builders, I think in 40 different States and Remember, if it's 10% in the survey, that means in some markets it's lower and in some markets it's higher. And one of the places they reference here is Boise, uh, where two people work for the same employer. It sounds like to me it's Facebook or Meta, but they're being told that they both have to come to the office three days a week or lose their jobs. They're probably gonna have to take a $100,000 loss in their home in Boise and the home that they are gonna end up buying in Seattle is gonna be much smaller. So. Mm -hmm. You just think about those markets. San Antonio <clears throat> is a relocation for remote work heavy market. Boise was a big market for that. Northern Colorado. Some of these start to make sense. Now, the question is, is this going to be, it's going to be positive, you would think, for Seattle. And um, just because there's there's not, there's still not a lot available in Seattle from the from the used home market. So for, for prices in the markets that people are being forced to move back to, I think it's going to, continue to push them higher. You know, super interesting article. Thanks, Olivia, for finding that one. And uh, you did this one, I think, from CNBC.com. Higher mortgage rates continue to impact the housing markets. Danielle Hale, Realtor.com Chief Economist. This was you, right, Beth, that found this one? No, this is, shout out, Becca. Oh, Becca. Okay, good job. Mm -hmm. But this is a video, so I don't know how to go into more of it. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to just embed the video into the show notes. No, we'll time out. We'll just pick a different article. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's like, we can't put articles that are videos in. Sorry. That was, I should have caught that one, but we gotta, we gotta be able to talk about it. Um, all right. Next up <laughs> from probuilder.com. Where is the housing market headed this fall with buyers and sellers glued to the sidelines of a high price undersupplied housing market? Experts weigh in on what's to come. What's to come? More <laughs> of the same. <laughs> the quotes in this were kind of wild. He said, I don't think it's going to get any better, but I don't think it's going to get any worse because it can't get any worse. Number one, don't jinx us. <laughs> Number two, we've seen it get worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've seen it worse than this. So I was shocked by that quote. I thought that was a little overdramatic. 
Yeah, and, and Pro Builder links to Realtor.com where the full article is. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll put that link in the show notes. But remember, they're talking about the housing market, meaning residential in its entirety. So when they say it can't get much worse, they're talking about existing home, uh, the number of existing home transactions that are occurring. Remember, prices are not bad. It's the number of homes that are are transacting that he's talking about being so bad. And guess who's still the bright spot? Yeah, I mean, what's the saying? I don't know if we can, but like t- tallest person in a room full of short people? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like you're, I mean, that that's the thing that kind of, it does affect my uh, mental health a little bit when people say, again, I'm talking to people not from our industry directly all the time who are like, oh, builders, man, this has just got to be like the best thing ever for them. Yeah. They're loving it. Now, there are we do have builders we're working with who are having their best months ever. Yes. But there are also a lot of builders who are, you know, eking by hitting their sales goals. Profitability is okay. Mm-hmm. But again, they're like, this is, this is just infinitely harder than it used to be. And then going into the fourth quarter, it's like, oh man, I really, I'm not excited for what we're going to have to ride through here. So mm-hmm. yes, yeah. it is a bright spot in terms of, I would say availability of housing. Yes. So if you, if you wiped builders off the map, there were no builders, the whole housing market would be, you know, I think the kids say effed. <laughs> like, so home builders serve a really important purpose and we are there, but the costs of doing business for builders are not improving as fast as we wish they would, which means affordability is still a challenge. Yeah. And while it's true that it remains market dependent, I think like builder to builder it's also really interesting to watch. I don't know if y'all have seen this, but we had a brief conversation of the doers versus the thinkers. And then there's the people that can think and do simultaneously, which is a magical little unicorn that everyone should have within their organization. But it's a matter of like, there's people that are in markets that are still doing well, but they just haven't gotten it right from the builder side because they're not sure how to take advantage of a market where they all where they are the tallest person in the room. They're not using the right messaging. They're not using the right messaging at the right phase of the funnel. They're not getting creative in what they're doing. They're just riding the coattails and then something blips and they're like, oh, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> and it's interesting. Yeah. And I love how it ends actually. It just says, who is still buying homes today? The answer, <laughs> those who have to purchase a home. And I think um, Rob Hahn, who's another one of our speakers at this year's event, I think he coined the term the four D's, which were diamonds, death, diapers, and divorce. I think we added the fifth D, which is displacement, which kind of talked about what the article in terms of having to move back to a different physical location or move physical location. That's the only reason people are buying. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not because that there's a red tag clearance sale going on. They're already in the market and that will potentially steal market share if you do that right. But there's not more people being created uh, by that activity. All right. Uh, Our favorites, things we love and things we hate. Let's just rename it that next time, Olivia. (laughs) Things we love and things we hate. Anything is up for grabs. What do we got? today i hate unpacking oh unpacking okay tell us more about that why do you have so much stuff (laughs) that's a great question and we keep purging julie and i were just talking about how like one of the beauties of moving is the ability to like it's a forced spring cleaning and so you you get to purge like i am still throwing things away left and right and we did that prior to moving but You know, it is just, can I just, can like all the boxes magically just, you know, like Mary Poppins into their place? Cause that would make my life really like a lot easier right now. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I love talking about it because we went, we're now done with it, but the whole mental connection that you have to your house and the things that you have to start thinking about again, that you stopped thinking about at your old house. There's all this emotional energy that's spent, intellectual energy that's spent for moving, mm-hmm. plus the physical, you know, yeah, blood-sucking, leech-like 
reality of unpacking cardboard boxes. Yeah. It's not a good combination. Okay, that's good. You can hate that. Julie, what about you? Um, well, this might be embarrassing. I don't know, but I've been listening to a new podcast and it's John Deloney and it's like the old school, like somebody calling in and asking for advice. Like oh, love that relationship love or um he's it's Dr. That's Deloney. what we should do. A counselor. Oh and like I'm fast like I'm obsessed with it right now. <laughs> That's what we should so do. So I don't know if it's cringy or weird. People would be like, why does she listen to that stuff? But I, no. I lo I'm loving it. I'm into it right now. All Dr. of us John millennials Oney. watched or listened to Loveline. Like, <laughs> let's be honest. It's not as racy. It's not racy like that. <laughs> it is. Um, but it's like just any kind of gets like a little mini counseling session. And so that is what I've been listening to lately. There was a gentleman, I can't remember his name, but... It was on Redwood Studios AM talk radio. And mm -hmm. every day he would take like three hours of calls and he would play solitaire. So you'd hear him shuffle the card sometimes like <laughs> live while he's answering people's questions. But every like nine out of 10 answers were get a lawyer. <laughs> people would call him questions and he would ask him a lot of questions. He'd be like, you know what you need, you need to do is get a lawyer. And this guy made a career off of telling people to go get legal advice. Mm -hmm. And that was Happiness. it. This one's more go get a counselor. Like you need trauma counseling. As well. <laughs> oh, as well. So this is like real life um, mm -hmm. crime podcast Th meets. This is I haven't killed anyone yet, but I'm thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Is it like a little touch of Reddit's <laughs> thread? Am I the a hole? Because like sometimes that's sometimes. also gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mine is a podcast recommendation that I got from another podcast that I listened to called Compound and Friends. It's a stock market one. Most of you shouldn't probably listen to it, but um, Acquired is the name of it. And they are, let's see, three hours, four hours, two hours. They're really long podcasts on a single company. Kind of giving, what they do is they go and they read eight to 10 books on a topic. They interview people. And then it looks like twice a month, they do these three hour summaries in audio format. And it's, I mean, it's, it's all LVMH, the NFL, Nintendo, Qualcomm. Did they do the Marvel one or the? Uh, Amazon, of course, uh, Altimeter, Sony, Peloton, FTX, uh, Standard Oil. Like that's a really old mm. company. Sometimes they do multiple parts, but. It's one of those podcasts where you don't, I don't feel compelled to listen to all of them, mm -hmm. but if there's a company that I really think does something well, or I use a lot in my own life and I'm curious about the background, it's just a really great, um, it's like in between an audio book and a podcast, typical podcast in length and complexity. Oh, well, that's fun. I'm already Googling all right. it. Yeah. Um, that'll do it. Wait. Oh, you have another one, Beth. Do you want to complain about it? Can you have something positive, please? Yeah, yeah seriously. I just love the, I hate this way. No, the positive of our house is I'm, so like by the time you guys see me next, next week, Monday, I should be in my office, in my new house. And I'm obsessed with the color that we painted it. It was a little bit of a risk going back to that word, Kevin. <laughs> um, but it's ripe olive by Sherwin-Williams. It's a deep, moody green. And my crown molding is painted it. My doors mm. are painted it. My walls are painted it. My panel. It is the whole office is this deep moody green and it is a vibe and I'm obsessed. Nice. So you like cozy, like cave kind of like, it's not going to be dark. Normally dark, no. It's green, but. Yeah, it has. And it has, it has the ceiling is white and the floors are white oak. Mm -hmm. So like it, there's a balance, but I don't know. I just, it gives that feeling of like, an old leather bag. Well, yeah, it looks notebook. like you should be signing the docu doc like the Declaration <laughs> of Independence in yeah. that room. Yeah. Basically. I need a I portrait like of George Washington on the wall. New goal. Uh, I learned something from my son Hayden. He's in fifth grade, so he has to do a report on a president. Mm -hmm. And he could be lying to me, so don't don't at me. He said he and I, he got second choice, I think, to pick any, any president he wanted to. Mm -hmm. And he picked Grover Cleveland. Okay. Now, do either that. one of you know any interesting information about Grover Cleveland? No. Nope. No. Apparently, allegedly, he is the only president to serve two terms that were non-consecutive. Mm. 
He was both the 22nd and the 24th president of the United States and had an incredible mustache. He did that. That is true. Yeah. All right. That's actually it. We're done now. The show is over. <laughs> Have a good week. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.